author this morning is Peter Reddish, um, who has spoken to us twice before, so he must be really good. <laughs> <laughs> After graduating from Reading University, Peter worked in the animal feed and flour milling industry in the UK before going overseas in 1984 to work for three years on a World Bank funded rural development project in northern Nigeria. Since then, he has worked on long-term assignments for the Asian Development Bank, African Development Bank, private industry, and latterly the European Commission. He has worked in a total of 13 different developing countries. His major assignments range from one year in post-Civil War Liberia and three years in the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific to his longest one that involved living for over nine years on the old Silk Road in Uzbekistan. Let's give a really warm welcome to our speaker, Peter. Good morning and thank you ladies and gentlemen. It's always a pleasure to come back here to probably one of the most dynamic U3As I know. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> You've just heard that I went overseas in 1984. <clears throat> Prior to that, I'd been working in the animal feed industry, flour milling industry, running animal feed mills, and then building them. And finally, dealing with the sale of enormous processing equipment for animal feed mills. That involved me travelling all over Scotland and northwest England. Also that equipment was used for distilleries, so I have the added advantage of knowing most of the distilleries around Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> However, it, around that time, the common market was boiling up. We had the common agricultural policy, and milk quotas suddenly appeared. Suddenly farmers found it less profitable to produce milk. They cut down on the number of cattle they had, which meant there was a reduction in the amount of animal feed being re required. Consequently, the feed milling industry was sliding downhill slightly, and I could see my income diminishing rapidly. At the same time, somebody approached me with the possibility of going over to Nigeria to work on a World Bank funded project developing agro-processing in northern Nigeria. I was responsible for the whole of northern Nigeria, which is quite a large area. And the agro-processing that was going on was primarily village or small town scale so that the local produce, which used to be sold almost out of the back door, and if it, if it wasn't sold, it rotted, so that all that could be gathered together locally and, and converted on the spot. So, off I went to Nigeria, arriving in Lagos. All the flights seem to arrive in Lagos in the evening, in the dark. Get into the airport and welcome to Nigeria. I am not joking when you get there when there's only one light in the entire arrivals hall. All the rest were either broken or stolen. Coming out of the airport, I was met by the chap in charge of the project over the whole country, and we spent the night in a hotel. That is an education just to drive through Lagos late at night when there is no power, all the roadside stalls have got candles or oil lamps on them, and you can just see the eyes and the teeth of everybody around. It's a different feel. I never felt threatened. We stayed in a hotel, which was half decent. And then the next day, we headed up to Ibadan. <coughs> Sorry. Ibadan, which is... Well, I've lost Ibadan. Somewhere over here. 
it's somewhere, there it is, there's Ibadan, there's Ibadan, that's where the head office was, and Ibadan was probably described by William Boyd in his book, A Good Man in Africa, where he starts the book by saying, like Rome, the city was built on seven hills, and there the resemblance ends. <laughs> And it did. It was on seven hills, and all I could see was a sea of shanty towns, apart from right in the centre of town, where you've got the standard concrete buildings. After a briefing there for a couple of days, I was put on a plane up to my new headquarters, way up in Kaduna, up in the north, literally on the border of the Muslim North and Christian South. Kaduna was quite a large city, and we found a reasonable house. Not bad. Typical house there. Of course, it had security guards, one by day, two by night. We had the banana palms outside, the usual things. And inside wasn't brilliant, but there again, it was so hot. You didn't want much stuff there. <clears throat> you hoped that the fans would work. You hoped that the air conditioning would work. There were bars on the windows, not to keep me in, but to keep others out, which were essential. And one of the problems in, that part, in Nigeria generally was NEPA, the Nigerian Electrical Power mm -hmm. Authority. Well, it, it was always known as NEPA, but we had a further interpretation of, the, of those abbreviations. <laughs> and the reason was that most of the substations at the end of the road, or the transformers, were oil cooled. And the oil worked in local taxis. So in the evenings, the locals would go down to the transformers and plunder the oil. As a result, the transformers blew up, and you never had any power anywhere. So, in the bottom of my garden, we had this generator. It was thundering away for three or four days at a time till power came back on, but at least it preserved whatever you had in your small freezer and kept the fridge going, <coughs> keeping the beers chilled. <laughs> Just on the street corner, there was a sign the hair salon. The bit that I would like to highlight to you all is that bit. <laughs> How do you blow out hair? And who would like that? Welcome to Nigeria. Shopping was running down the, going down the street, running along the street were lots and lots of stalls, fruit and vegetables at the stalls. There were some supermarkets, they rarely had stock. You got to know the local expatriate community quite fast. And when my wife came out, they said to her one day, do you need any butter? She said, yes, I do. She said, well, they said, well, so-and-so's had it, but it's all gone. <laughs> but never mind, I bought 14 pounds and you can have a couple. <laughs> that is how you existed on, the, on any imported stuff in Nigeria. And of course there were mosquitoes around. Yes, I caught malaria, but it wasn't too bad, in spite of taking the tablets. Once I'd had malaria and it had been cured, I never bothered with the tablets again, all the time in, Nige in Nigeria and in other African countries, and I never caught malaria again. One thing I did catch, though, was I was bitten by a putsy fly. I was bitten in the small of my back way out in the bush one day. <clears throat> it blew up. It came up rather like a boil. I went round to see the doctor to see if I needed antibiotics because it was beginning to become painful. He said, just a minute, I know what that is. He squeezed it and out popped a maggot. Oh. <laughs> yes, that's what a putsy fly is and they also go for dogs and cattle, mm -hmm. but they'd chosen me. Mm -hmm. Life in Kaduna was not bad. There was a former race course there, in the centre of which was the Polo Club, a very nice 
place. Thursday evening they had small chop. It, the wives took it in turn to provide all the appetizers. There was the rugby club, a couple of pitches there, a couple of good, good teams and the usual ambiance of a rugby club. And that's where the social life was concentrated. I had to do a lot of travelling as I was covering right across the whole of Nigeria, right over there, way over to, as far as Chad. Um, this area up here is bordering on the Sahara, really sub-Saharan country. So occasionally you'd see the blue men coming in, the Tuareg, with their camel trains coming down to Kano. And I had to go over to Jos quite often, which was up in the hills, rather like the days of uh, the British in India, when they used to go up to the hill stations. <coughs> and there was a hill station up there. And my wife came with me up to Jos. She had connections with Nigeria. In fact, she was born there. People say, why were you born in Nigeria? She said, my mother was there at the time. <laughs> The reason being that her father was in the colonial service before World War II started. He'd been posted as an inspector of schools to Nigeria. <coughs> World War II started and it was a very risky trip to go home because of the submarines all the way up the Atlantic coast. So we went over to Jos, to this building. That's the earliest photograph I can find. And it was one of her great uncles who built that building, he located the spot and built that hill station. And my wife also played golf when we were in Kaduna. Yes, they had an 18-hole course. They didn't have greens, they had browns, which, was, which were made of oil sand, but it was a tolerable golf course. It had a road running right through the middle of it, unfenced, and at one point, I think it was the 15th hole where you drove, and you had to drive right across the road to, to a green or a brown on the other side with traffic going backwards and forwards. I remember one day seeing a motorcycle coming along and all of a sudden the guy on the back of the motorcycle back like this because the ball passed between the, 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 the guy driving the thing and him. Also the Fulani up there are a tribe who have lots and lots of cattle. They're nomad. And you would have lots of cattle wandering across the golf course. So you'd have to stop for an hour till it all cleared off. And then you'd go out again. But the interesting thing was, my wife was in the clubhouse one day looking on the board. And she looked on the monthly medal board. Her father's name was there. And he'd never mentioned it. Mm. And another thing about my wife being there, she used to accompany me on quite a lot of my trips. And one trip I had was to go way out, out there into the northeast, almost up to the border of Chad, to look at a rice mill, which had been funded by the World Bank, put into a village location. And you think, Sahara, rice, well up there, top right hand corner, is Lake Chad. There are rivers running into Lake Chad. The soil up there, if you can get water on it, is good. And it, they grew rice. And that was becoming a, a staple in the diet of an awful lot of people in Nigeria. So up we went. We spent the night in Kano. Headed off at crack of dawn next day, just as it was coming light. And we ended up parking in a village under the mango trees. My wife stayed in the car with the driver, the windows down. And... I talked to the headman of the village, went in to see the rice mill to make sure it had all been delivered and installed, and it was. It was properly bolted down, so it made it difficult for anybody to steal anything. I came out, and the car was surrounded by children, about this high. There must have been 50 of them, all very polite. <coughs> I walked up to the car, they parted to let me get into the car. I got in, and they all said goodbye, and as we drove off, I said to Sue, where did all that lot come from? She said, I've no idea. And the driver said, excuse me, sir, they let them from school. 
They have seen White Master, they have never seen White Madame. <laughs> In our lifetime, they had never seen a white woman, so they were let out. She's dined out on that many times. <laughs> and I've just highlighted the bottom right-hand corner, that red block. Do you remember Boko Haram and the 250 schoolgirls? Yeah, yeah. That's the part of the world where they were they were kidnapped. You wouldn't go up there now. People say, wherever I've been, there's always been bother. <laughs> Usually after I've been there. <coughs> Christmas was a, a festive time in Nigeria, as well as back home. We were coming home for Christmas, so we weren't interested in a turkey, which the Lebanese traders said they could get. We came back in January. We said to people, how was Christmas? They said, fine. I said, how was the turkey? Oh, we had a good one. And somebody else said, well, ours was a bit tough. And they said, then we started to investigate, and it had a long neck. They discovered that the Lebanese had run out of turkeys and substituted vultures. <laughs> oh, yes. Whatever you hear about Nigeria, believe it. <laughs> From Nigeria, I was invited to go down to Zambia, <coughs> down to Lusaka, to run a vegetable oil, margarine, and uh, vegetable oil, margarine, and soap factory. That's what it was. A large one which had been built about 15 years earlier. It had been commandeered by the government, it was state-run, and it was falling into disrepair, and it was also not producing what they needed. And cooking oil is a dietary staple in Zambia. You cook your meat in the cooking oil, you don't save it or throw it away, you use it as a gravy there and then. So, cooking oil was a one-time consumable. <coughs> Had a nice house there, very nice one, larger than the one we had, <coughs> we had up in Kaduna, and a very nice sitting room, enormous sitting room, lots and lots of space, lovely, bright and airy, and a nice pool. So we thoroughly enjoyed three years in Zambia living there. My boss at that time came from a German company based in Hamburg. He would come out in the middle of the summer, and I would get, go to Hamburg six months later. It worked very well with those trips. Klaus came out. We were sitting having afternoon tea around, around the pool, when all of a sudden there was a, a noise going on behind us from the, the spot where that uh, photo was taken from. An awful lot of noise. It sounded like a huge crowd. Then on the other side of the wall, behind the orange tree over there, there were shots fired. The police were there. This was a riot because they pushed up the price of mealy meal, another staple. And we had the rioters on one side of the house, we had the police on the other side, so at that time we decided we would take afternoon tea inside. <laughs> Fortunately, there was no damage to the property at all, and they all disappeared. We had an extremely good house servant called Saidi. He'd been trained by the British Council donkey's years before he came to us. Very nice, tall man. He looked after the, the house for us. He was superb with pastry, and if one of the ladies wanted some quiches making for a lunch, then she'd ask if Saidi could make them, and he did, and of course, he got a little backhander as well. <coughs> Not that we worried about that. We had two dogs, also, while we were there, two Labradors. My mother came out, and we were having breakfast in the breakfast room. Yes, we had a breakfast room in there as well. Next door to the kitchen, and there was usual hole in the wall, serving hatch from the breakfast room to the kitchen. Saidi served breakfast, retreated into the kitchen, 
and there was a lot of clattering and banging going on. So my wife called out, Saidi, coffee. No coffee on the table. All of a sudden the clattering stopped. Sorry, madame. And there was an, oh, blank, blank, blank. My mother's face was horrified. Her jaw dropped. And then he came in, put the coffee on the table. He said, sorry, madame, I was killing a snake. Oh. <laughs> My mother's jaw dropped even further. <laughs> My boss there was Kenneth Cowunder, KK, you may remember. A very nice man. Whether you agreed with his politics or not was something else. I went to a breakfast meeting in State House one day. There were about six of us. He was hosting it. The breakfast was served as a buffet. And you walked up to pick up a plate and KK stood there and handed you your napkin and your plate and had a chat with you. He did it to everybody. And I've seen him do that when there have been a hundred people. I've never seen any other head of state get that, that involved. One day I was in my office in the oil mill. And of course cooking oil is an essential commodity in that part of the world as it forms part of the diet. And my secretary came in and she said, Peter, the old man's here. I said, you what? Peter, the old man's here. He's not Phoebe, you're joking. She said, he's here. And at that moment, the door opened, in came KK, and he said, Peter, how much cooking oil is there left in this country? Nobody can give me an answer. Because there'd been questions in the parliament that it was in short supply and they thought there was a crisis. And of course, Zambia down in the south, you've got Victoria Falls, a gorgeous site. Vic Falls are superb. The economy in Zambia at that time wasn't all that brilliant. Zimbabwe was on the up. Now the situation is totally reversed. So every couple of months, we used to do a shopping expedition down to Harare. We would drive down, stay Friday and Saturday nights in a hotel, Saturday morning we'd go and do all our shopping, pick up several cases of good South African wine that had come north, fill up the car generally. On Saturday evening we'd go to the cinema. There was no cinema in Zambia, so that was a real treat. And then we'd go out for, for supper. On the Sunday morning we'd pack up and leave, drive back home up into Lusaka. The, the trip each way was about four hours, and every time we did that trip, we saw elephants all over the place. There's another view of Vic Falls from up above, and we used to go across the border at Victoria Falls. This bottom corner here is Zambia, this is Zimbabwe, and there's the bridge, the road and rail bridge across, across the Victoria Falls, Mosio Atunia, the smoke which thunders. And in the rains, the cloud of mist coming off looks as if the whole area of bush is on fire. It's a fantastic sight. Cloud, uh, <clears throat> we were checking out of the hotel on the Sunday morning, and a voice said, Hello, Peter. And I turned around, and there was this chap, Dante Saunders. Dante was a member of Kaduna Rugby Club. He, he was Zambian. He was a, a merchant, a traveler backwards and forwards across the border, doing all kinds of deals, importing, exporting, all the usual stuff. I said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm waiting for so-and-so. He should have picked me up two hours ago to take me back to Lusaka. I said, well, we're going up. Do you want to have a lift? So he said, yeah. Okay, thanks. Left a note with the reception in, in case his intended taxi turned up. And so we came up to the customs on the Zambian side of Victoria Falls. Dante was well known to all the guys in there, and the customs office and passport office, all one long table. All your documents just rippled all the way down. 
Dante went in, handed over his passport, and he was, good morning, Mr. Saunders, good morning, Mr. Saunders, how are you, Mr. Saunders? And he was out of the door. I'm still at stage one. <laughs> I'm a white man with a car, with my wife's passport, my wife's passport, all the paperwork for the car, etc., etc. Dante came back in, put his head round the door, and he said, Oi, what are you doing? What are you doing to Peter? They said, we are processing his stuff, sir. He said, well, get a move on. He said, I told you I'd make it one day. You're keeping my white driver waiting. <laughs> <laughs> there was a wonderful attitude there. Nigeria was quite good, but the Zambians themselves, forget racism. You're all part of this mess. We're in it together. It was lovely. And that is the Anglican Cathedral in Lusaka. And in the last few months, we were invited to attend that cathedral, a very special day, which we will both remember, because the Pope was there. The late Pope, oh, Saint John Paul now. He was speaking. He went up the main aisle, he shook hands on one side, he came down the main aisle, and he shook hands on the other side. And my wife and I, um, Delighted to say we both shook hands with the Pope. That really was the highlight of our stay in Lusaka. And you may remember this date, 9th of November, 1989. The Berlin Wall. I mentioned that I was at that time working for a German company. When Klaus had been over in Lusaka, earlier in the year, he said to Sue, have you ever been to Berlin? She said no. He said, well, when Peter comes to Hamburg in December, you come with him and we'll drive up to Berlin. <clears throat> we got off the plane in Hamburg, Klaus met us and he said, Sue, I'm sorry, we can't drive to Berlin. The wall's just been breached. The traffic is absolutely horrendous on that road. He said, there's no way we can get there. So Sue looked a bit crestfallen. and he said, but don't worry, I've managed to get the last two seats on the two o'clock flight tomorrow afternoon, but it means we won't come back until about 11 o'clock in the evening. No problem. So off we went. We were there the third day after the Berlin Wall was open. My wife is what the Germans call a woodpecker. She still has a piece of the wall. She does say it's in the same coat that she had in those days. I don't believe her. She's had lots of coats. But we saw them in all their shabby anoraks, in the trabants and all the tatty little motorbikes coming over the border. We had supper in what was just a steakhouse on one of the main streets in Berlin, sitting by the window, and we looked up and there were noses pressed against the glass, staring at us, just looking at what we were eating. Quite disconcerting. If we hadn't lived for a long time in Africa, I think we would have been totally put off our <coughs> own. But what I didn't know was, just over three years later, I'd be behind that wall, and I'd be working there for the, for the next, ooh, 15 years. Because my next assignment, after Zambia, was a project setting up the agricultural strategy in Odessa, in Ukraine. When the Berlin Wall came down, the Soviet Union collapsed. All the countries around Russia set up on their set off on their own declaring their own independence and whoever was running the country at the time of the berlin wall came down took over as president or whatever the only problem was that they all received instructions hour by hour all the time of the soviet union from moscow they had the telephone line all the instructions came in when could you go and cut the hay when could you send the tomatoes? When the next load of potatoes had to be sent on the next train? All that sort of thing. 
they had never taken any decisions. So we, were, we had a team of expatriates looking at the Odessa Oblast, trying to get the whole thing up and running again so that the pr produce didn't go to waste. Well, in Africa, one advantage is they have the English language in a lot of countries, and they certainly have the Latin alphabet. A sudden shock to the system. Odessa in Ukraine. You've got to learn Russian. You've got to learn Cyrillic. That is mind-blowing. I had an apartment there in this block, not the whole block, an apartment in there. You remember that sitting room, that great big lovely sitting room? Well, that's what I got. <laughs> that was the Soviet variant. And the huge double bedroom. <laughs> it wasn't a bad life there. There were very few expatriates in Odessa at that time. There were no tourists coming in at all. And it was quite an enjoyable time. Odessa has the mo one of the most glorious opera houses in the world. They say it's second only to Vienna. We used to go down there regularly on a Saturday night. You never knew what was on, ballet or opera, but it was always some form of entertainment and then have a meal in town and have a, and a beer and then come home. My wife came out at the end of January to celebrate one of her big birthdays. And so I took her to the ballet. To get from the apartment to the ballet, we had to go on the tram. Not a problem. I booked a box, dead center. Way up at the back, almost the royal box, an eight-seater. I just paid for that. She and I had that box to ourselves. That opera house has the most gorgeous two-and-a-half-ton chandelier. It's a beautiful opera house. We saw Swan Lake. We came out. We got on the tram and went back up towards the apartment. But we got off one stop early. And we went down into Arcadia, which was the lovely promenade along the sea with gardens alongside and a couple of restaurants, specially re reserved in the Soviet days for the nomenclatura. My wife and I had fish and chips and a bottle of local champagne. I know how to give a girl a good time. <laughs> we walked up the hill. My wife said to me, thank you, that was a lovely evening. She said, it must have been expensive. I said, it was. She said, go on, tell me how much it was. I said, I've got change from five US dollars. <laughs> For the lot, including the royal box. And one trip that we had to do was in January, heading up further north, coming up onto the steppe to visit a soft coes, one of the state farms. They're, the state farms were as big as some of our counties, enormous areas. And the step, that's the step in summer. This was in the winter when there was snow all round. It was about minus 16 or 17. And after we'd had the meeting with the director of the soft coes, we had lunch. And it was in a glorified scout hut. No heating around our table, we're all there in anorak scarves and gloves. But at the far end, there were a couple of furnaces going where the women were all boiling up stews, stirring away like mad, and the bit of heat was trickling down our end. It was during that meeting, over lunch, that I discovered vodka can be a wonderful interpreter. <laughs> My basic Russian, the director's basic English, and somehow we were managing to communicate through the meal. I had an interpreter there at the time, but he was chatting to other people. 
And I managed to say to the director, what on earth do you do here in the winter? And he, he said, well, you can't maintain the machinery. You'll get frostbite. He said, you can't go out and do anything. You've just got to look after the cattle. And there's a fight amongst the people on the farm to look after the cattle because it's lovely and warm in there. He looked down the scout hut to the women still stirring these great cauldrons and he said, you know, it's a very long winter unless you like fat women and vodka. <laughs> I apologise if anybody takes offence to his sexist remarks. <laughs> From that point, I was next heading over to Bishkek, heading east into the stands. Some of you have heard my talk on the great uh, of the old Silk Road. That's part of the old Silk Road. Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan, a small country, very, very mountainous. It's got a couple of, ba a couple of valleys that are reasonably flat, and that is it. And there is Bishkek. I was living in an, another apartment block. This was an L-shaped block that was sit, stand on my balcony, look out, and you look at all that lot. And they put windows on their balconies because it gave them extra space. And in the, su in the summer, they would go into the market, stock up on buckets and buckets full of cherries, tomatoes, gherkins, etc. And they had kilner jars about that big. And they fixed, they preserved everything in these Soviet kilner jars and stack them all on the balconies all through the year. That was my apartment. Okay, it's not bad for a sitting room. The bedroom wasn't bad. The facilities could be with a bit of modernizing. We were on the third floor and there are another floor, four floors above us. So you could hear an awful lot of rushing water coming down the side, down that pipe. <laughs> And there he is, Lenin, telling them, as, as the locals would say, the bread queue starts over there. <laughs> well, I like to think he was pointing straight at my office. This is the Ministry of Agriculture, and in that top right-hand corner there was my office, together with four other European consultants. We had the most gorgeous views. If you got fed up with work, you wanted a break, you'd walk out onto the balcony, not at the front here, at the back, exactly the same, and you could stare at those most gorgeous snow-capped mountains, permanently covered in snow. It was a gorgeous view, it really invigorated you. And then, one weekend, we had a trip. We were invited on a helicopter trip up the second longest glacier in the world, the Enilchek Glacier, in a Russian helicopter which was delivering mountaineers and uh, foodstuffs to a base camp. Well, you don't turn an invitation like that down. So off we went. We were picked up way, da way down beyond the base of the glacier, <coughs> taken up the glacier, and there we were offloaded, together with the climbers and all their equipment. There were six of us, including my wife. <coughs> that helicopter didn't stay there, it cleared off. The mountaineers got busy with all their stuff, made some tea, the six of us wandered around there, had a natter, took photographs, all the usual stuff, glorious views. We were up at 14,000 feet. The air is awfully thin. So all you really wanted to do was sit and drink tea. We were up there for three hours, beginning to think, where's the helicopter, when it suddenly appeared, over there in the distance.
Behind, we had Peak Pobieda, 24,000 feet. We're at 14,000 feet, and that lot's towering above us. And our helicopter is there. I have never been more grateful to see a Russian helicopter coming to collect me. A spec we survived. On the way down, the pilot suddenly said, look, down there, down there. And lying on the glacier, on its back, with its legs in the air, was another helicopter. He said, last year. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> and one other trip I did, I had to do, was way down here to the Chinese border to visit some farmers down there to get their opinions on what they could do with their land. Right down on the, the border with China. And those mountains, that's the road out there. We had to stop on the way overnight, drive up there, up to the mountains over which the Torregot Pass goes, and that's 12,000 feet high, closed for about four or five months of the year. We, were, we weren't going over the pass, fortunately. We were just visiting just down here. And it was the 18th of December. In three days' time, I was due to drive from Bishkek to Almaty in Kazakhstan to get the flight home for Christmas. I was concerned having had to go down there at this particular time anyhow. As I said, we had to stay on, on the way in order to get down there on the second day. So we had our meeting. And there's my interpreter, Zenip, standing there. Very intelligent girl, superb English she spoke. We talked to the farmers. It was barren, it was cold. They invited us into one of their cottages for green tea. They had camels outside. We were having hot bread straight out of the oven and green tea when the door opened and in came the boss, the farmer. That's not the boss, that's another photo that I took, but very similar. He'd been out on his horse with his golden eagle. He came in with his eagle, put it on its perch in the main room of this cottage, went out again and brought in a dead silver fox and just dumped it on the floor. As he brought it in, I looked out and it was snowing. And I thought, 18th of December, it's <laughs> snowing. We've got a few passes to go over. Am I ever going to get home? We did get home. I did get back to UK for But I'll never forget how cold it was up there. And this guy was making his living going out hunting for foxes with his golden eagle. Fascinating. And in the summer, of course, they have the yurts. We've all heard the glamping stuff, haven't we? The, the yurts out there. <coughs> Kumis. That's the, that's the drink they serve to the guest of honour. It's fermented horse milk. That's the inside of a yurt. Definitely not glamping. I remember sitting down over lunch in a place like that, shoes off outside the door, sitting cross-legged in a circle with all the men. The di director on my left, my interpreter on my right, she was allowed in because she was my interpreter and I, I needed her as I didn't speak any Kyrgyz. We, the dishes were all placed in front of me. I had to take what I wanted and it went around the table, around the floor. And a dish came in and was put on the floor. <clears throat> and I was talking to the director in Russian. <clears throat> and Zenit, my interpreter, said, Peter, Peter. I ignored her. Peter, hold on a minute, I'm talking. Peter, and nudge me. So I said, what? She said, your foot. I'm sitting cross-legged on the floor, been there for an hour and a half or whatever, getting all stiff and achy, and I'd shuffled around a bit. They brought in the final dish. 
on a platter, placed it by my feet. My shuffling around had meant that my stocking big toe had gone into its mouth. <laughs> I shuffled back surreptitiously and then had the, had the privilege of carving the head for all assembled. You're supposed to carve it into 32 pieces. The tongue and the palate are reserved for the women because it makes them good seamstresses. <laughs> Don't ask me how. I, of course, had to have an eye. <laughs> Next port of call, Tashkent, on the, on the, the old Silk Road. <clears throat> Tashkent, you'll remember, those of you who heard before, there'd been an earthquake, it all fell down, the old build, a lot of the old buildings went down. The Russians came along and put up all these IKEA-type kit buildings. I was in a building. That was it. I was on the top floor. That was my apartment. It wasn't bad. Until we had a huge earthquake one day, my television fell over and the screen smashed. The bathroom wasn't bad. We're improving. The markets were good. Plenty of produce to be found, and lots of invitations from a very hospitable nation. This is Navrus, which takes place in March, when it is bitterly cold, when you're invited to come along and have a plov, which is a rice pilaf cooked in cottonseed oil with very chewy, fatty sheep bits in it and pomegranate seeds. It's cooked overnight by the women and you have to be there at six o'clock in the morning to eat it. The women have been up all night so they think that you men can get up early and come and eat it. You've eaten it at this special ceremony, sitting at tables like this, you never know who's sitting opposite you. I sat at one where the, the Prime Minister was sitting opposite. All invited, all go, by seven o'clock it's all over, you've been drinking green tea, your stomach's bloated, and what do you do? Do you go, you can't go back to bed, you don't want any breakfast, the only thing to do is go to, go to work. So if you went into work early, quite often you'd find other people in there you didn't normally see, and you knew they'd been invited to a plov as well. Weddings, great ceremonies there, a special season, Two months of the year between planting and beginning harvesting. The parents never go. The married couple walk around the town being photographed left, right and centre with their friends. Their parents are back home preparing yet another plov. <coughs> and Tashkent, anybody's interested in steam locomotives? Well, there's a lovely <coughs> locomotive museum there. And that lady standing there, just look at the colour of her hair, fiery jack. That is the standard hair dye in the former Soviet Union. That's the only one they ever had, apart from the more, most outlandish blonde one. No tones at all. And the aircraft, yes, I've flown in that aircraft out over the Aral Sea with a party of journalists. A biplane, canvas covered wings, one engine. 20-seater. Fascinating. I wouldn't do it again, though. <laughs> and then we started to get a change. <clears throat> well, I thought it was a change. After I'd left the old Silk Road, I was asked to go down to Liberia, down in West Africa, the country which was set up for all the freed American slaves. Again, very nice people. But I was there at the end of the Civil War. There are diamonds down there in Liberia and in Sierra Leone. I don't know any, whether anybody ever saw that film Blood Diamond, Le, Leonardo DiCaprio, and the horrors that were shown in there. Well, believe you me, they only touched the surface. Liberia made a lasting impression. I had a bungalow there in a compound of four surrounded by security men. 
No electricity, no, no water, mains water. Anywhere in the capital, Monrovia. All on generator and water tanker. My bungalow in that compound had power from six o'clock in the evening through till seven o'clock in the morning. That was it, because all the diesel for the generators had to be imported at vast cost. Fortunately, the office generator started at eight o'clock in the morning and ran through till six. So you spent your day in the office and the evenings back in your own home. And that's the centre of Monrovia when I got there. That's the back of the bus station. Sadly, we see an awful lot of photographs like that these days from the Middle East. It's horrific when you are there. A bombed block in the course of construction. The locals have moved in and they're living on every single floor, putting their little shacks in there better protected from the, the elements. And there's a lamppost. You can see the bullet holes through it. It was all over the place. The president was elected when I was there, a lady who'd worked for the World Bank, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. She has been replaced by George Weir in the past year. George Weir was a footballer. He was world, he was voted the world's best footballer donkeys years ago. Very nice man because the, my office was in a house a little further along the coast and his was next door. Used to see him quite often. But Ellen Sirleaf Johnson was a lady who as president had no delusions of grandeur. She was like Kenneth Cowunder. I saw her coming out of uh, a formal dinner one evening in a hotel and people standing outside. She was surrounded by security men because the place still was unsafe. And she suddenly shot across the courtyard, across the parking area, to where a crowd was standing and her security men were trying to stop her. She said, no, 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 fought her way through. It was someone she'd recognised. She'd been at school with them. L another <coughs> lovely lady. And the only trip I did out of, out of Monrovia, I had to get specially sanctioned, going in a Land Rover with, with two-way radio the whole time. <coughs> and we were going up to the northern border. This is the main road out of Monrovia, up to the north, their version of the M6 or the M1. That's one of their so-called service areas. We had the radio. Every half hour we had to phone into base, call into base, just to let them know we were all right. At night that went back to every two hours and you had to take it in turns to get up in the night just to let them know that you were all right. <coughs> You can see a tanker coming up the same version, up the same road. Horrific conditions there after that war. You go into a supermarket. There were only two or three items of each thing on the shelves. There was a reason. If there was a riot, the mob would break, the, break through the doors. They would clear up everything on the shelves. If you wanted half a dozen, you asked them, and they went into the back in the warehouse, which was a strong room, so very little outside. You came out and got in your car, you were immediately surrounded by at least 20 beggars, either on crutches, limbs missing, hands missing. The favourite trick, you're not going to fire a gun. No, I'm not. No, you're not. We're well, cutting your hand off, so you can't. It was everywhere. It was horrific. And on one trip out into the bush, amongst these most enormous trees, there's the Land Rover. I photographed that lady in a village. And to me, the look in her eyes encapsulates all my feelings of that particular country at that time. And thereafter, I went to Sudan, not for very long. 
Sudan was still Sudan. There was no South Sudan in those days. But if you flew down from Khartoum down to Juba in, in southern Sudan, somewhere you crossed an imaginary line. Because in the north, it was Arabic. In the south, it was African. Totally different. The bad news was Khartoum, there's no alcohol. Get down to Juba and there's plenty of decent beer. People have heard probably of the whirling dervishes. There they are. Friday, Friday evening at about five o'clock, they meet on the edge of Khartoum and they start whirling and whirling and whirling until they fall down. In that was incredible. And on the banks of the Nile, there's this boat. It's on the White Nile. It's about 30 or 40 feet away from uh, the mooring. <coughs> it's used by the, the Nile Yacht Club as offices. And you might remember General Gordon who said, send the gunboat. That's one of his gunboats. He had two. They were shipped out in pieces, assembled. That is the only one that remains. The Nile flooded horrendously about 20 years ago. She was washed ashore, dumped there, and they can't afford to put her back in the water. So General Gordon's memorial is there. And southern Sudan, full of refugees, I spent two weeks in a camp, in one of those tents, on the back of a refugee camp. A saddening experience, but lovely people. And then, of course, the Solomon Islands. You all know I was in the Solomon Islands for three years. Total contrast from the middle of Africa and all the deserts and all that warfare ending up in the Solomon Islands. Way out there in the South Pacific. Millions of miles to get over there. Fly, fly to Brisbane and then three and a half hours out to Honiara. And it was on the flight from Dubai to <coughs> excuse me, Brisbane, that I, I looked at uh, the air hostess who was serving my meal. Her name was Nargiza. I looked at her, that badge, Nargiza, I said to her in Russian, Akuda, where are you from? She said, you speak Russian? I said, yes. Do you speak Kyrgyz? because that is a Kyrgyz name. She said, I do, I'm from Samarkand. It transpired that I knew her father in Samarkand, who was active in the human rights. She had got a job. Her family, father and mother had come from, uh, from Uzbekistan to join her in Dubai. They got work there as well. The world is a very small place. And of course, what luxury after all those traumas in Liberia and, Su and southern Sudan to sit on beaches like that. And we have a colonial history in the Solomon Islands. <clears throat> that is the, uh, the, the old High Commissioner's residence up on a hill. It's no longer there. All that remains are the steps. But close by, there's a machine gun um, still there. Um, under the palm tree. Everywhere you go in Solomon Islands, World War II memorabilia is everywhere. That concrete strip is down the middle of a village. That goes back to the old colonial days, just, just below the High Commissioner's bungalow. It's 22 yards long. It was covered in coconut matting. It's the cricket pitch. Still there, in spite of a war being fought across it. And of course, the people in the Solomon Islands, always smiling, always happy. And I couldn't resist putting this one in. I found it the other day. What does it say? It's sitting there. Yes, you're right. We regret this item is temporarily unavailable. <laughs> 
I have yet I have yet to find out whether it is the wrapping or the contents that are unavailable. <laughs> and of course, all the all the grass skirts, the dancing that you miss, the pipe bands, glorious cultural over there. It had to end, and my final assignment was in Kenya, Nairobi, or Nairobi as they call it. <laughs> yes, it's got another railway museum there. Nobody ever goes to these railway museums. You can walk around, climb over everything. It's fascinating. That locomotive was made in Manchester, shipped out in bits. And that is on one of the carriages I noticed that one of the engineers was killed, a man-eating lion, dragged him out of the carriage and killed him. And they have that carriage sitting there. But the livestock around there is glorious. People go to Kenya to go on safari. They go on long treks from Nairobi, way up north. Forget it. Nairobi has a national park. On two sides, it is totally unfenced. The city is around the other two sides. You see characters like this, gir uh, giraffes. It's half an hour's drive out of the center of uh, Nairobi until you're in the park. Giraffes all over the place. Lions. And this one, under the tree, is the only shot I've got. There are a couple of rhinos there. But the reason I bring up this tatty photograph is, look at the skyline. That is Nairobi Airport, and there are wild rhinos wandering around the back of the airport. And of course, there are some glorious sights. Hundreds and hundreds of zebra coming down to have a drink. And I'm beginning to need one of those as well, as my throat's getting a little dry. So as they say in Ni northern Nigeria, ladies and gentlemen, Nagode. Spasiba in Russian. Rafmat in Uzbek. Tagio Tumas. Thank you too much in the Solomons. And Asante Sana. Thank you. Thank you.